right, hello everybody. Good, good noon to you. I, I always like it when it's just before class starts so I can say good morning and not be awkward. <laughs> um, so last time we talked about disinfection. We're gonna continue with disinfection today. We will uh, basically be finished with um, kind of all the core topics of disinfection by the end of today. Um, on our syllabus, we have Thursday as well dedicated to disinfection. So what I'm going to do Thursday is give kind of a research um, look at things with ongoing research in my lab to kind of apply it to um, what we've got going on. I've been actually working on revising a, a paper, so I'm going to show you some of that data um, and discuss um, what we've been up to. So th hopefully that'll be interesting. Um, I won't test you directly there on that material, but uh, as usual, all of the materials building this knowledge base that you can use to understand the problems and to understand how, how these principles apply to um, problems outside of the, the ones we directly work on in class. That leaves us uh, next week. We'll, we're still um, technically in the water treatment section we will have a lecture on um, the Flint water crisis. So that'll be kind of a, uh, another, another case. We, I will give you a Moodle quiz on that um, at some point, but a, kind of another topical area that's building on the content, giving you more context, kind of adding some more flavor to the class, I hope, um, should be interesting. And then a, a day for exam review so we, we're still a little bit far out from the exam. All right, so that's kind of the plan for the next couple weeks. Uh, the syllabus remains the same in terms of exam number two. I, I guess I'm finding that I'm moving through content a little quicker, having prepared the, the PowerPoints the way I'm doing. Um, that and or the, uh, the lack of fall breaks. I'm not sure which one, so at any rate, um, that that's all good, and um, we'll get back to where we started, where we left off last time, which was talking about the uh, chemical disinfectants and calculating, okay, at what rate are they going to disinfect our pathogens, given uh, the parameters um, in the system. So we were taking a look at this contact time or CT concept, where really our dosage was the concentration of our chlorine or of our ozone, whatever disinfectant we're using, multiplied by the time that it was in contact with the pathogens. Now this, uh, this equation was fairly straightforward. We had it, you know, some rate constant for the uh, coefficient of specific lethality, how, how lethal was this disinfectant to the given pathogen we're interested in. Um, we had the concentration of the disinfectant with a dilution coefficient in case it's not very well mixed. We could adjust for it there. And then multiply that times our concentration of the pathogen itself. That's the variable that's changing. That's our what we're doing the mass balance on is that dn dt. For the most part, we will assume C is constant. Um, if it wasn't constant, then we have a second order uh, equation in a sense, because it's dependent on two different variables that are changing with time. So that, that would complicate things. We're gonna assume that that's constant, and this is what we call Chick-Watson kinetics, where this becomes the Kc to the n, becomes kind of one constant where we have that C star, or the K star, excuse me. Um, and then we can input this in directly as if it was a typical rate constant where you, that we've been dealing with um, into our systems kind of in the same manner. Okay, uh, now as you apply this to your mass balances, don't forget that you do need the, the N here. You know, as we, as we think about a CSTR or something, uh, for example, at a steady state CSTR will look something like this, Q and not. So this is accumulation rate at steady state is zero equals what's coming in minus what's going out. So Q, N plus the reaction term, in this case it's going to be a negative because we've got disinfection happening. And that negative, that would be a, in that volume, we'd have the V. And here we put in the K star. So 
in that volume then we put in this reaction term right so that's just like what we've done in the past um, we could do this in a batch or a plug flow in this case I'm just showing a CSTR so then we'd have that k star n to the one power so k star n now the uh, confusion could be if you if you saw that if you wrote it out as kc it would feel like you already have the concentration there because the c is there but the c is constant and we're doing the mass balance on n so we've done this many times already just uh, reminding you how this gets plugged in to your mass balance equation uh, just the same way as we have been doing okay so from there we we briefly mentioned all right this k this uh rate constant, it's specific to each pathogen and disinfectant pairing. This is some data I collected um, during my graduate studies where we were taking a look at producing sort of a, a radical, it's called single oxygen. It's basically the oxygen we breathe except excited to a more energetic state, and so it reacts with things more quickly. Um, and it was disinfecting some viruses here. and. You know, it, this is a little bit complicated, but if you take a look at some of these lines, you can actually fit them pretty well, at least at the early stage um, on this log plot. And so we could extract Ks for this, because this was a batch case. So then our DN DT here would have been, you know, negative K star N. In a batch system, that will, you know, will end up getting n over n naught equal to e to the negative k star t or you could do the log and you know this time I, I have log plotted but it's you know if you take the natural log you just have to account for a factor instead so we'll pretend I'm doing the natural log here n over n naught that's going to be equal to negative k star t and again, if, if you did a natural log, you just divide that by some constant. Um, I think log, so log of e, something like that. Um, anyway, you can see that you can extract this k from that data. Um, if you get the slope of a, of a regression where it's linear, then you can estimate that k from experimental data. And so what I want to do next is show you that process for... Uh, this example problem from, I think this is from one of the uh, online books that are available online. So here we have this problem, and I'm not going to give you something directly like this on an exam because this requires Excel or at least a graphing calculator. And as much as I, I love graphing calculators, and you should probably all be able to do this on a calculator, um, that's not really the skills I'm, I'm testing you on. So I'll, I'll leave this type of problem for either give I'll give you the the information you need up front or I'll um, it just simply not ask it so the the exercise though will help you understand that the way we derive the rate constants and how kind of the the numbers and practice match with the um, what we call the kinetics the understanding really what's happening on a quantitative level for a disinfection Okay, so we've got the data for HOCl disinfection of poliovirus at a concentration of 1.8 milligrams per liter. It's shown below, uh, adapted from a study in 1979. Temperature was 20 degrees Celsius, pH was 6. Determine the rate constant of inactivation, assuming Chick-Watson model applies with N value of 1. Okay, so Chick-Watson, DNDT, equals negative KC times n. Okay, now it gives us a couple of pieces of information. Um, it's giving us 1.8 milligrams per liter of HOCl. Then it gives us the temperature and the pH. Um, if we were to do this really carefully, we would have to calculate the, um, the equilibrium, you know, HOCl is in equilibrium with H plus and OCL minus. So then we'd calculate, you know, we wanted the rate constant of inactivation. So really we would be considering the rate constant of HOCL. Um, that's what it's referring to. And um, 
you know, that, that's the stronger disinfectant. So we would need to calculate that. And at pH 6, um, 20 degrees Celsius, that, you know, that's the equilibrium rate constant does depend on temperature. Uh, you don't need to worry about that. I'm, whenever I give it to you, I'm just going to give you the rate constant. So the Ka is 10 to the negative 7.54 or something close to that. So at pH 6, we expect a lot of the, you know, most of the um, chlorine to be in the form of HOCl. So for the sake of simplicity today, I'm going to say assume 100% HOCl. You know, if we were going to be really correct about this, um, it's really something like 98%. Okay, so then that would be 1.76 or something, 1.7, you know, somewhere around there, um, milligrams per liter of HOCl. But for the, for the sake of um, simplifying this, what I want to do is take a look at this reaction. And here we don't, we're not given much information, except that we're looking at um, just disinfection, you know, in some water. So we're going to assume this is a batch case. You might not know to assume this right away. That's fine. Um, almost any time we're studying kinetics, if we can, we're going to do it in batch because this equation is just simpler. You don't have to worry about flow rates or so much about um, non-ideal reactors. If it's uh, easy to just put a little stir bar in there, and make it pretty much perfectly well mixed. Um, so this n is equal to 1. So the question is, what is k? And if we were to plot this data, there's a couple ways we could plot it. And we'll say over time. It's not going to work out so well for me. One second. Not sure why, but sometimes it stops showing me my cursor. Okay. So if we look at time versus this plaque forming unit, that's how we count the, the viruses. They form little plaques. Um, if we directly um, take a look at this, where we have time of zero all the way to time eight seconds, we're inactivating on that scale, and up here we've got you know, 6,000, something like that. Um, or really, this would be a little above 6,000. Um, so our time zero would be up there. Our time two would be about half that. Our time four, so halfway, up, halfway through this would be somewhere like half again. And if we were to draw all this, it would look something like that. Um, and what I'm going to do is grab Excel to show you exactly what it is. Um, but that's not so useful because then we can't draw a straight line. We have to do this exponential. Um, and so what will be better is to graph it as a natural log. I say better, it'll be more convenient. And if we graph it as the natural log of n over n naught, then we should expect to be able to have some straight line and get the kinetics from it. So in the, way to, the way to do that then would be take this slope, and this will be k. Um, this will be y equals mx plus b when we get the uh, equation, where y is this natural log of n over n naught, m is the slope, x is time, and B is kind of wherever that we start there. Actually, what will end up happening is we'll have zero right here because if we take the natural log of the beginning point, so the first point on the time zero, natural log of 6,152 divided by 6,152, it's a natural log of one. And the way to, you know, the answer, the solution to the natural log of one is zero um, because z anything to the zero power equals one. Okay, so I'm going to switch over to Excel.
I've got this data um, entered already. So here we have uh, the same data here, the time in seconds, platforming units, uh, which is a number. And then I took the natural log of n over n naught. In the formula, you can see here it's natural log of C4, here the cell, divided by, and I put in a uh, dollar sign before the four so that that way when we fill it down, it'll stay as four. So it's basically, uh, if we step down a notch, you'll see what it's doing is taking the current time point, that concentration, divide it by the initial time point. So that's literally just showing that um, natural log of n over n naught. So the, the current number divided by the starting point number. Okay, so that gives us um, those values there. As we see, our, when our fraction gets smaller and smaller, so 300 divided by 6,000 is going to be, you know, just on its own, 0 .00 something or somewhere around there. So if we were just to do 300 divided by 6,000, yeah, 0 .04, 0 0.05 basically. So the natural log of a fraction like that is going to be a negative number. Um, so the smaller the fraction gets, the we get a larger negative number. Okay, so with that, what we'd want to do is insert, oops, insert a graph. Just want a scatter plot, please. So I'll delete that one for now. All right, so it already grabbed the, uh, the data for me. Great. So this is the, the case where we're plotting the platforming units by itself, the number of platforming units versus time. And so we see that exponential curve that I, I drew in the uh, PowerPoint. Um, so that's, that's good, and we could tell Excel to do an exponential fit and maybe find the parameters that way, but it's not as simple and straightforward. So we're going to set that one aside. Um, repeat it here, and I'm going to change that data. To be the next column. So we're going to do call it this one. Okay, and here we have this natural log plot where we've got uh, pretty much a linear line now and we can add a regression to this. So I'm gonna add the trend line. It's gonna be linear and we will, I'm gonna move Excel just a little bit so that people online can see. So we've got linear, and we're going to set the intercept to zero because we were defining it that way. And we want the equation to be shown, and we've got the R squared value. OK, so that's our equation then. And we see here that we have y equals um, neg negative 0.375 times x. So that's y equals mx. Right, and we said b is zero, so it's y equals mx plus b, but there we go. Our r squared is kind of the goodness of fit. It is quite, uh, quite excellent there, 0.998. So we're pretty confident here that this is the right way to analyze the system. We've got first order kinetics showing here, and we can extract from that that our, in this case, um, we set b equal to zero, y equals negative, 0.375, well, 376, 0.376 times x, which in this case was time. So then that means our rate constant there, k, is going to be uh, negative 0.376 
per second. And actually, we don't put the negative there usually. But that's by definition that it's a decay term. So usually, we'll, we just express the it that way. The negative is coming from the fact that uh, it's a decay. That's built in here. So my apologies. OK, does that make sense? So it's pretty pretty neat. Um, tool to, to get these rate constants that we've been using in our class uh, from, from the data. All right, and we know it's per second because our, our time values were in per second here. Of course, we could transform this if we needed to uh, to some other value. All right, so with that, I want to move on to talking about UV disinfection, so ultraviolet light. Um, I've got a bunch of slides, a bunch of pictures, so hopefully this will be uh, interesting. And then we'll get to um, the quantification of it uh, after this. I wanted to kind of show you the pictures, show you the, the technology before we get into the equations, because I think um, we kind of need to understand what's going on with a system uh, before we take a look at the math. It, and in essence, the math is very simple. Um, again, just like the chlorination, it's pretty much dosing. Um, so what dose are they receiving? But instead of the chemical, it's the, the amount of light, amount of photons that are received. Okay, so when we talk about ultraviolet light, uh, there's a few categories, and we're almost always working uh, on a basis of wavelength and nanometers. Technically, you could put it in meters, and it would just be like 10 to the minus 7th, you know, 4 times 10 to the minus 7th would be this 400 nanometers. Um, so there's, there's a few different ways. Uh, sometimes, especially when looking at infrared, you might count the number of waves that pass in each centimeter. So the units would be per centimeter, and then it's kind of inverted. The more waves pass, the shorter the wavelengths. Anyway, th there's a few ways to look at it. This is going to be the most common one, especially for um, environmental technology. You can consider the visible spectrum of light to be between 400 and 780. Um, that takes us from that infrared area all the way down to violet. Um, now, e this is literally a spectrum, right? And the way we <laughs> say that phrase, oh, this is a spectrum. What we mean here is like you can actually probably see a little bit into the infrared, your your light receptors, and this is probably somewhat variable based on the color of your eyes and just some other factors. Um, and certainly different organisms can see in different uh, wavelengths and perhaps even more detail within the visible spectrum than we can, um, and some more limited. So this depends a lot on the bio biology, biochemistry, and the optical physics and all that uh, to do with our eyes or other organisms' eyes. So we can likely see a little bit into the UV. Uh, it'll just be really a, a violet color um, and also kind of tailing into the, the infrared. But primarily what we consider is 400 to 780 is our spectrum and then we can identify um, you know, specific colors. Our typical green laser pen is I believe 532 uh, whereas our red laser pen is somewhere like 680 uh, something like that. So um, you can you can go to the color wheel and sort out all sorts of different colors here, um, but what we want to talk about um, mostly today is the ultraviolet range. So since we don't have colors laid out because we can't really perceive these, what we've done is we've classified it as UVA, B, C, and vacuum. So down at the vacuum, you really need to apply a vacuum if you're going to shine this light and observe it because the atmosphere, oxygen, and uh, maybe even the nitrogen, but uh, certainly the oxygen absorbs that light so strongly that it's just going to um, cause the light not to go anywhere. Um, in fact, what you, you end up doing is creating lots of ozone if you're shining light in that range, which is why we have an ozone layer up in the upper atmosphere, because we have oxygen. It's absorbing all the this vacuum UV that the sun is emitting, and that's causing photochemical reactions, splitting the oxygen apart, creating ozone. Uh, that's also the same is true for the UVC. Um, oxygen 
to an extent absorbs it, but ozone absorbs it strongly as well. It's also going to be splitting things apart. Um, and so in terms of what travels from the sun and hits our atmosphere, uh, the atmosphere is taking away almost all of this stuff. And then it kind of starts dropping off and doesn't, doesn't absorb so much of uh, things above that. So what we receive from the sun is kind of the, the inverse here where we've got just a little bit of UVB that's coming in, a fair bit of UVA, and then it ends up looking something like that. Well, not, not quite that. It's something more like that. Um, and probably goes back up. I don't know. But the if you take a look at the typical solar incidence um, graph um, as, you know, in terms of what we receive at the surface of the Earth, it's going to look something like that. It's a lot more complex. There's particular bands because the chemistry of the sun, there's certain emissions that are strong, so it's going to look a little bit spiky and interesting. Um, but overall, it kind of has that shape. Um, and the, the major point is there's just not a lot of UV coming through because our atmosphere is protecting us. So with that, um, it kind of helps us understand what's going on when we try to use ultraviolet light to disinfect stuff. Um, it would be very bad for us if UVC was hitting us because this is what we call germicidal. It's, it will denature DNA, cause mutations, um, and as you probably can guess, that's carcinogenic um, in some sense. So the UVC here, uh, we'll call it mutagenic. UVB um, and UVA can both be somewhat hazardous, especially UVB. This has maybe, this is between about 280 and 315. It's sort of the middle section. A slight bit of this is still kind of mutagenic, can cause uh, DNA damage. Mostly this is kind of the sunburn um, and causing your, your cells to start producing more pigments. Um, that's kind of in this range right around here. Um, so as I think especially the sunburn, I'd have to go back and double check the exact specifics, but I, I believe sunburns are generally caused kind of in the low UVA and in the UVB range. And then uh, this upper UVA is more um, pigment um, producing. So if you've heard of antioxidants, a lot of the, the role of antioxidants in our skin is to combat uh, reactive oxygen species that are created when these energetic photons hit a molecule and excite it and create something like that single oxygen I mentioned a little bit ago, which is pretty reactive with stuff. So our almost all of our pigments are actual actually can be considered antioxidants as well. So they're they're designed to absorb this light and prevent other molecules from absorbing it and causing bad stuff to happen in our in our cells. Okay, so with that, our focus is going to be on UVC in terms of using it for disinfection. Uh, next time when I'm giving you that kind of a research seminar sort of thing, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the UVA portion and how that can be important in, in some cases. Okay, so what does it look like when you apply ultraviolet light? Well, if you were to go into some biological lab or a hospital, something like that, you'd very likely see one of these UV lights. And I've got one in my lab across the street as well. So the, this is a low pressure mercury lamp. Um, if, you, if you were to look at fluorescent lamps in some office building, and in here we have fake fluorescent lamps. They're actually LEDs that are kind of just look like the fluorescent um, form factor because that's what we've gotten used to designing for. Um, basically, it's the, almost the same thing where we've got um, slightly pressurized or perhaps uh, reduced pressure mercury vapor um, housed in this container. And then we put a electrical potential across it, causing that mercury to fluoresce, which creates lots of light. Um, now, one of the strong emission bands for mercury is in the ultraviolet range. For the, the lights we typically have indoors, we have a nice coating. Um, it's a white coating that protects it. it 
absorbs all the UV for us. So if you were to somehow scratch that off and the glass used was allowing it to go through, then you could actually start receiving some ultraviolet light. The, the difference in pressure, the uh, control, as well as kind of the primary emission. We also have what's called medium pressure mercury lamps that they have a different spectra we'll see in a minute. Um, but the UV lamps, they actually have to use kind of a quartz, a fancy quartz glass to allow ultraviolet light to pass through it because it's um, normal glass will absorb it at least, at least most of the radiation. So if we're trying to apply it, in this case, to disinfect the surfaces uh, that we're going to work with, then we want that good transmittance and we want to just be able to expose it here. Now these labs and stuff, you'll see, uh, this one has a safety glass um, for the cabinet that extends all the way through here. And that's going to protect anybody on the other side because you don't want to be looking at this, be very bad for your eyes would eventually cause blindness and bad for uh, your skin. So anytime anybody's working with these, you know, all these benches will have a safety lock where it, once it opens, it'll cut off that, uh, that light. Or if it didn't, you'd want to be very careful to turn it off. Always wear eye protection and all that. Okay, so in practice, what this could look like, you may have a system where you have the um, UV light sheathed inside a quartz sheath that you can clean and let water be flowing across it and around it. That's uh, this picture here. We've got this larger tube with water going through it. Uh, so we call this immersed. This is actually the most typical one. Um, so where you immerse your light into the water, you protect it with this quartz sheath. Um, as you might imagine, that quartz is going to be pretty fragile. The, uh, the light inside is also fragile and contains a toxic chemical, mercury. Um, so the, there's a few factors here that are, you know, you kind of have to be careful with, which is one of the reasons that it's uh, pretty exciting to see ultraviolet emitting LEDs coming online. Again, we'll, I'll tell you more about that on Thursday. The other option is to leave the water inside something like a quartz casing and put your lamps outside so you don't have to worry about um, you know, cleaning something that's directly next to the lamps or the lamps themselves. You can just clean this tube. And it, I actually I found this, this particular graphic. I'm sorry I didn't grab the source for this one. I have sources for most of the others. Um, saw this in a, a presentation where they're talking about a specialized plastic that has a pretty good UV transmittance. Um, where most of the light will go through and the plastic would potentially be cheaper and easier to maintain um, for, for this kind of system. So that's another promising one that would be, uh, so I forgot the, the exact term for it, but it's basically the not immersed, it's, um, yeah, <laughs> not immersed. Okay, so talking about the wavelength. When we're looking at the wavelength of light emitted by our lamps, I mentioned before the low pressure and the medium pressure mercury lamps. Really what we're interested in is this germicidal range. And we know something about the germicidal effectiveness based on the absorption of DNA. So this plot here is an estimate of germicidal effectiveness of different wavelengths. And technically you have a very low effective but still slightly effective out through the UVA range but that's more like hours and hours of radiation rather than seconds or minutes. Um, so you can use solar light you may have heard of SOTUS solar disinfection that just takes a very long time and it would be important to enhance that because solar light again is is basically nothing and starts doing that. Um, okay so when we take a look at this germicidal effectiveness, that's basically how well is DNA absorbing this light and therefore reacting with the light to break the DNA. We see the low pressure mercury. This is kind of a, one of the industry standards. A lot of our UV disinfection uses this. Um, we see that it intersects right here, pretty effective. And we've got this very strong singular peak. Um, so it's a, a pretty good choice. 
Uh, medium pressure is not quite as efficient because you see all this right here. Um, turns out they're sometimes more effective or more uh, convenient to operate at high capacity systems. There's also some evidence that the added wavelengths emitted here kind of help prevent, um, cause a wider range of damage and prevent bacteria from recovering. Um, again, a topic I'm going to talk to you about uh, on Thursday. And so there may be some reasons why you, you like to use medium pressure. Um, so it's used fairly often as well. Uh, but basically I wanted to show you here this picture of this wavelength really matters. If you shift it 10, 20, 50 nanometers off, you're going to have a much different response to um, the light that you're emitting. Another way to look at this would be DNA absorption and comparing this. Uh, this is got a few figures and a, a few um, clippings from our uh, that textbook I, I referred you to for the membranes. Um, for UV disinfection, our primary book doesn't cover much, um, so I'm using chapter 13 from that book. So here's a picture showing the inactivation of a virus, MS2. This is a virus that infects E. coli. It's very easy to study. We, we have some in my lab. And then this Cryptosporidium parvum, that's the, um, that's the um, parasite, the eukaryotic parasite that's generally difficult to disinfect. Um, UV is actually a great option for it because Cryptosporidium is a larger organism, has more DNA, more likely to be damaged um, kind of a, on a statistical basis as light's passing through. Um, okay, so we're taking a look here and we see that the typical DNA absorption here in this black curve corresponds pretty well with the, um, the let's see, this is the effectiveness of different intensities observed. So it, this DNA absorption predicts pretty well how well the how effective the light is at disinfecting these two pathogens, or pathogen surrogates. MS2 is not a pathogen. You could probably drink it and be fine. Okay, I don't recommend that. Don't do that. Um, so, uh, moving on, the another you know uh, another way to take a look at this is again more inactivation rate constants relative to 254, um, and I'm. I'm forgetting which pathogens, and I don't have the, the legend here, but several different species are here. And we see, again, this, this kind of shows that between 240 and, two, and to 300, it's tracking that effectiveness curve, that DNA absorption curve. When you get below around 250, you start getting to the point where we're forming lots of radicals based on splitting oxygen and creating ozone things like that, it just gets complicated. So I'm not surprised to see, even if DNA is not absorbing, we have lots of uh, pretty intense stuff happening down there. There's all sorts of other bio biomolecules that may start absorbing as well and, and doing uh, bad things for the cells and viruses. Okay, so how does it work when, we, when we're using this germicidal, um, these germicidal rays? Well, when we take a look at DNA, uh, we normally think about it, about it kind of like a zipper, in a sense, where we have uh, this genetic code composed of these bases and base pairs where, you know, one side has something and it kind of matches with this one. And as DNA is functioning normally, you would go through if it needs to replicate or, uh, you know, produce some um, proteins based on the genetic code. It'll go through, you'll have an enzyme that uh, unzips it, matches it with something, some other you know, substrate to produce more of that, more copies of it. So it's like unzipping, copying, pasting, and rezipping, so kind of some process sort of like that. So what happens when you hit it with the ultraviolet light is you essentially, it's called dimerizing. dimerizing. So you make a dimer, meaning two molecules stuck together, so when you have two bases of a certain type next to each other, they can react when they absorb ultraviolet light and create a dimer. And it would be kind of like taking super glue and putting a drop of super glue on a zipper and letting it dry and then trying to zip 
uh, or unzip that zipper, it's just not going to work because it, the, um, the mechanism is going to get blocked when it reaches that spot. So the enzyme then would be like the um, whatever it's called that you actually move to, to zip or unzip the zipper. That enzyme is serving that function, so it's, it's going about its business, and then when it hits that spot, it just uh, can't go any further. So um, it's no longer able to uh, replicate that part of the DNA. Okay, so that's the way uh, we cause damage and certainly it shouldn't take too many of those spots to cause uh, the DNA to be uh, unable to be replicated any longer. Okay, our book again, This uh, and this is our the one that's available online, MWH, I believe, um, shows another example of that where we have these these two thymine bases and when they um, get dimerized, you have that reaction, so they're connected now. And so as, you know, normally it would be splitting and happy, and then when you get here and it's splitting, it can no longer continue splitting at that juncture. Okay, so just looking at it a little more technically there. Okay, so as we consider how do we, you know, what do we do with all this information? How do we apply it? Well, the first first consideration really would be how much light are, is, is our bacteria, is our water receiving? And we've already, in a sense, taken care of this in our treatment train if we've done sedimentation and filtration. Because here we need, you know, the first thing to consider is particles scattering um, or preventing, protecting the pathogens from light. So if we've got a lot of particles and the UV light is shining, we can have what we call refraction, where uh, the light is going through the particle, but you know, as if you've ever looked into water, you know, in a swimming pool or something, and it, it looks like you're looking straight through, and you see you know something on the ground, and then you reach, and it's actually the the light has tricked you. It's actually refracted, so it's at an angle, and you you actually reach closer or further from you uh, than it you know your sight looks like you know than what it looks like to your vision. Uh, that's a that's refraction in action so if the light is being moved maybe it will miss uh, particles that are or pathogens that may be on the back side of the, the particle or or whatever so it's some way changing where the light is going to be received you can also have simple reflection off a particle um, or scattering where it's you know not not exactly reflection, but ends up going off different directions, um, kind of a more diffuse uh, system. And again, this is all the types of uh, phenomenon that turbidity is measuring. So if you have high turbidity, that you have lots of particles, they're doing scattering, refraction, reflection. The light's kind of going everywhere and not necessarily this nice direct stream that would have impacted the, um, the particle, or the uh, pathogen. Another thing that could happen is the pathogen could be literally inside the particle and the UV light just can't penetrate that far into it. Okay, so those are the, the reasons we need to get rid of the, um, get rid of particles from the water. Another issue is light absorption. And this is going to be um, true basically of any solution. So we have a a law called the Beer-Lambert law from chemistry or from optics where we know something about how much light is going to be attenuated or absorbed based on two things. Um, one is how far the light's traveling through it. And that becomes obvious if you've ever um, if you've ever been doing anything recreationally in the water and you you can observe the visibility, right? You even in the atmosphere we see it sometimes like whoa the visibility is x number of feet or in the water maybe you know oh it's only eight inches you you put your arm in the water and you can't see your hands right it's you've got some um aspect of that visibility now here we're no longer talking about the particle scattering so um it's not quite that drastic of like muddy water your hand disappears but the color will start changing if you have 
like tea, for example, or some stained water, food coloring, that's absorbing some light. So what food coloring is doing is absorbing some light and then only other colors are coming through. So if you, if you were to um, shine a, a bright beam of white light through some water with food coloring, you're only gonna see the remaining light coming out that, um, that did not include that, that type of, that color that was absorbed. All right, so the, so the first thing was, is the distance going through it. So that's the length here. Uh, the next thing would be the amount of stuff that's absorbing at that uh, wavelength. So in our equation, if we look at um, the log of how much light, so the incident light, I naught, um, how much we have at the end versus how much we started with, so I over I naught, this is going to be equal to this x here is the distance. You're not going to need to solve with this equation. I'm explaining the equation so you understand what's happening. Um, but I'm not going to not going to be asking you to solve Beer Lambert questions. So I just wanted to explain here what's happening. So that we'll say the delta intensity. Nah, I'll, I'll we'll write it we'll write it properly. So this log of I over I naught is going to be equal to this negative epsilon at some wavelength, so lambda is our wavelength, times the concentration times L. So X is just the distance here, so this is L. Now this epsilon is the molar absorptivity. So how much light does one mole of this particular chemical absorb? So food coloring absorbs lots of light at specific wavelengths. So that, that's what colors the water. <clears throat> Anytime we see lambda here, this is going to be wavelength. This is our standard nomenclature. And C would then be the concentration. So we use this quite a lot in general chemistry and in practically every you know, almost every every type of chemistry, wet chemistry lab sort of stuff, um, lots of atmospheric chemistry as well. We use this principle so that we can measure what concentration we have of some chemical if we know that we've got, you know, if we know that chemical has some absorbance at a given wavelength, we have these little colorimeters or spectrophotometers in just about every lab. So you'll you'll see this quite often and you can you know, if you know what you're what you're looking at in terms of the the chemical and some property about it, you you have the system where you have this little cuvette and it's exactly one centimeter in most cases. So then you can very easily calculate the concentration based on some known factors about it. And so you, it's very likely that you've done this in high school chemistry and have maybe forgotten about it or or general chemistry here, um, any sort of chemistry lab you're going to experience something like this. Um, in our case, we're interested in this because stuff in the water is gonna absorb our ultraviolet light. And it's gonna do so quite effectively. Even the water itself and the oxygen dissolved in the water will be absorbing the light. So in our case, we need to know this partly just to understand how much light the system is gonna receive. Um, uh, there's an example plot here where we have absorbance by I think this is two different fractions of Suwannee River natural organic matter. I don't know what the U stands for. It's maybe some other type. Um, but basically, natural organic matter that was harvested from a, a natural source. And if we look at how much light is being absorbed at different wavelengths, we see it's basically just increasing as we get further and further into the UV. So if our UV 254 is right here, that means these guys are absorbing pretty strongly um, whereas in the visible range, maybe we could barely see it. Um, maybe it's blocking a little bit of the blue light and we see kind of a brownish tint to the water. But when we get to the UV, we have a large amount of light absorbed. So that becomes very important if we have a lot of organic matter in our water. This is also true for if we're disinfecting wastewater 
we're going to have lots of organic matter in that water. Um, there's not always easy ways to remove organic matter. Um, you could do reverse osmosis. Um, sometimes you can use an ad adsorption process, uh, some activated carbon, kind of reduce some of the uh, organic matter load. Uh, but in general, this is just a, a factor you're going to have to work with uh, so that you can know how much light is actually going to be received. Okay, so the point being here, we're going to end up with this I, so that irradiance or incident light um, that's transmitted through, and that's what we're going to be interested in. And again, I'm not going to test you on this stuff, but I wanted to explain what's happening so we know that when we're dealing with a, an intensity given, you can kind of understand what, what goes into that intensity and why, why that matters. Okay, so the, the rate equation we're actually going to use, and again, I've taken this from the chapter 13 of um, MWH book. We have the rate at which our pathogen N is, is changing based on the radiation at some wavelength lambda. Um, so it, we'll read the definition here. Rate of change in number of organisms exposed to light of wavelength lambda. Okay, so that is going to be equal to negative N. So this is first order, N to the one, times, um, I guess this is a capital lambda. Um, this guy is the coefficient of specific lethality of wavelength lambda, and this is going to be in square meters per joule. So this is kind of this is our rate constant in a sense. How how effective is this um, light at some specific wavelength? Just like the chlorination was, um, you know, or chemical disinfectant was chemical dependent. Here we've got wavelength dependence. Um, so you would, you'd be given, um, or maybe would need to calculate, um, given other parameters, this uh, coefficient, and it's working just like a rate constant. Okay, so in other systems, you know, in our Chick-Watson kinetics, this is negative n times k times c to the n, right? That would be each parameter kind of equivalent. So then if K is that coefficient of specific lethality, then I is that intensity of light at wavelength lambda in watts per square meter. Okay, so we can consider this uh, a germicidal intensity, kind of like we did that K star in the Chick-Watson kinetics. Um, you know, the, if the intensity remains constant, then basically that's kind of the same deals where we have, you, you might be given a simpler term just to say the germicidal intensity is, and in fact our primary book has a problem and it gives you that, and it's just, you know, it's nothing different than, you know, you didn't need to learn anything about UV radiation, it's just that's the way it is. Um, it's just a rate constant that you're given and you solve a problem. Um, so I'm not, not meaning to complicate this, I wanted to tell you a lot about UV because I think it's interesting. Um, but at the end of the day, we're dealing with pretty much the same thing as we learned about for disinfection, which was pretty much the same thing we've learned about all semester. It's a rate, there's a constant, um, it, this is first order, and it's a first order decay. Okay, so the dosage um, we can describe just like the contact time was that concentration um, in contact with the bacteria or the pathogen times time. Uh, in this case, and I, I wrote it wrong here, this is going to be the irradiation. Times time. Um, and as we'll see in a moment, we can call that fluence. That's our UV dose. So again, I apologize. I did, did not uh, fix this here. So the dosage then we can define 
uh, as I mentioned here, that average irradiation intensity, so average UV intensity, and that will be milliwatts per centimeter squared times time. Uh, watts is joules per second, so if you multiply it by a time in seconds, then you're going to end up with a dose in joules, or in this case, millijoules. Um, you know, you can convert between millijoules per centimeter squared and milliwatts. Um, you know, you can go from millijoules to joules, things like that. Um, I'm going to try to make the problem straightforward so you don't need to convert between, uh, between them too much, but you should know that the joules to watts um, is watts time, watts is a per second deal, so if you multiply by seconds, you end up with joules. So what I'm asking you to remember is basically that one watt equals one joule per second. Okay, so just remember that definition, SI units. That way you can, um, that'll essentially remind you that the dose is going to be I times T. All right. So at the end of the day, there's there's not a lot different than um, the other other topics. There's just a lot that goes into understanding what's happening to the light as it's going and uh, what we care about in terms of the factors affecting it. All right. Um, so at this point, you know, it, we could solve problems with. Um, you know, you can, you can calculate the dose if you know the intensity um, given over some time. Then you can cal calculate the dose required to achieve some three log inactivation or something like that. You can solve problems with how many bacteria are going to be removed given, uh, given this information, just as you would with um, any other rate. All right, so I think that's it for now. Um, so if there's any questions, be happy to uh, to help you. If, uh, if there's any issues with the homework, um, any questions on this topic? Yeah. I do have one question on this topic. So it has to do with that chart with the U with the UV rays for the effectiveness. Yes. I'm trying to think of why would the uh, the vacuum. Okay, so the question here is why is the vacuum UV not, not on this chart? Um, it's a good question. The vacuum UV would have an effect and it would be probably a profound effect, um, but it's not really reasonable to use it. So if, so if you think about the atmosphere, you know, the stuff we're breathing right now, we have some amount of oxygen, nitrogen, even a little bit of ozone um, just naturally present. If that is enough to absorb all of the light coming out of a vacuum UV emitter, um, you know, which, you know, a vacuum UV uh, wavelength, then imagine trying to put that through water, which is much more densely packed with molecules. Um, water is going to be absorbing, and I didn't mention this, but water starts absorbing light pretty heavily somewhere around here. Um, so if water is absorbing light, then you know. It, it's really not going to transmit very far at all. So that it's a, it's practicality more than, um, more than actual like physics. Like it, it would disinfect stuff if it could come in contact with it. I, I can guarantee that. Um, but in order to measure it, you know, maybe you could do it in a, in a vacuum and see okay how effective is it to kill this bacteria but then you're exposing the bacteria to a vacuum and who knows if it can handle that <laughs> you know maybe the vacuum is disinfecting it so it just becomes difficult um, and so that's why they, they don't bother putting anything usually below 220 230 uh, for that reason it's a good a good question anybody online you guys doing okay I had probably more uh, more slides than um, the normal this time but I wasn't sure how long it how quickly it would go okay so got a question can I scroll up to the first quantification slide um, are you 
talking about this one here. Um, see if you can give me a slide number. I'm going to sort through a few. I'm a, I'm a few seconds delayed from you, so just let me know um, which slide number is the correct one. think this is the one you're looking for just let me know <laughs> that one saying that one doesn't help because I'm moving and I'm not sure when you said it compared to when I was moving um, okay so just let me know um, if nobody else here has any questions that's all I've got for you today I will be posting the cryptosporidium quiz soon um, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna answer any more questions I've got here while they're on, so feel free to stay. Or um, yeah, that quiz will be on the reading. I'm gonna do the same thing as I did this last time, assuming that uh, didn't backfire um, too badly. I'll give you some time limit, so it's not like you've got hours and hours to uh, to go find the answers. I want you to have the answers somewhat on hand, um, and then uh, and then I'm gonna let it reveal the answers to the questions after the deadline for the quiz is passed so that you know there's no one sharing answers or anything all right oh i will see you guys on thursday okay and i'll stay on just a couple more minutes in case you had any questions there um, but otherwise class is over See you guys on Thursday. Um, always welcome to email me if you still had a question. You're not sure here. Um, so, goodbye for now.